Helen Gibson, born Rose August Wenger in August 1892, passing away in October 1977, was an American film actress, vaudeville performer, horsewoman, radio performer, film producer, trick rider, and rodeo performer. She is considered to be the first American professional stunt woman and one of the most dangerous women in American history. Let's learn more about her life in this video. She was born Rose August Wenger in Cleveland, Ohio, one of five girls to Swiss-German parents, Fred and Annie Wenger. The architecture of Ohio reflects many German elements, showcasing the influence of German architecture on that state. Her father had wanted a son, she recalled in an interview years later, and encouraged her to be a tomboy. This is a huge difference between the virtue signalers of today who place their children on puberty blockers and encourage mastectomies and genital mutilation. Wenger's father encouraged her athleticism and to become accomplished with a pistol. Perhaps influenced by her mother named Annie, Wenger was influenced by uh, Annie Oakland as well. Even though her name was Rose August, I will refer to her as Helen or Gibson in this video as that was her stage name. Helen saw her first Wild West show in Cleveland in the summer of 1909 when she was 17 and working for a cigar factory. She answered a Miller Brothers 101 Ranch ad for girl riders in Billboard magazine. They taught her to ride, and she performed her first 101 Ranch Real Wild West show in St. Louis in April 1910. They would remain a lifelong presence. She was quoted as saying, I was already practicing picking up a handkerchief from the ground at full gallop. When veteran riders told me I could get kicked in the head, I paid no heed. Such things might happen to others, but they could never happen to me. We barnstormed all over the U.S. and the season ended all too soon. I was sorry when I had to go home and could hardly wait to open in Boston in the spring of 1911. When the Miller Arlington show suddenly closed in 1911, it left many performers stranded in Venice, California. Thomas H. Ince, who was producing for the New York Motion Picture Company, hired the entire cast for the winter at $2,500 a week. You can learn more about Ince and his Inceville organization in the Parties of Marion Davies video on this channel. Ince created a revolutionary work play organization on the California coast. The performers, including Helen, were paid $8 a week and boarded in Venice where the horses were stabled. They rode five miles each day to work in Topanga Canyon, where the films were being shot. In 1912, Helen made $15 a week for her first billed role as Ruth Rowland's sister in Ranch Girls on a Rampage. Like many of the cowboy extras, Helen continued to perform in rodeos between pictures. Rodeos offered prizes and were a way for Helen to maintain her skills while earning extra money. At the second Los Angeles rodeo in 1913, she was featured in the Standing Woman race, and so impressed one of the investors that he offered to finance a tour of rodeos for her, paying all expenses and splitting the winnings. At the investor's ranch outside of Pendleton, Oregon, Helen worked his horses every day and learned new forms of trick riding. In Pendleton in June 1913, she met Edmund Richard Hoot Gibson, who was her age, and would die in 1962. They began working together, and at a rodeo in Salt Lake City, they won every prize, the relay race, the standing woman race, and trick riding, in addition to Hoot winning the Pony Express race, but the promoter of the rodeo skipped town and they did not get a cent of the prize money. That summer, the couple performed in rodeos in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and Boise, Idaho. They arrived in Pendleton a few days before the Pendleton Roundup was due to begin. 
However, because rooms were almost impossible to obtain, they decided to tie the knot as married couples were given preference, and as a result, the landlady gave them her own room as a mini honeymoon. Gibson would recall sleeping on benches and her preference for sleeping in actual beds. They won enough money to return to Los Angeles, where Hoot worked as a cowboy extra and double for Tom Mix at the Seelig Polyscope Company in the Edendale District of Los Angeles, now known as Echo Park. You can learn more about prostitution in Los Angeles in its video on this channel. Helen also worked for Seelig and for the Calum Studios in Glendale. In April 1915, while on the Calum payroll doubling for Helen Holmes in the Hazards of Helen adventure film series, Helen performed what is thought to be her most dangerous stunt, a leap from the roof of a station onto the top of a moving train in a Girl's Grit episode. The distance between station roof and train top was accurately measured, and Helen practiced the jump with the train standing still. The train had to be moving on camera for about a quarter mile, and its accelerating velocity was timed to the second. She leapt without hesitation and landed correctly, but the train's motion made her roll towards the end of the car. She caught hold of an air vent and hung on, dangling over the edge, which increased the effect on the screen. She suffered only a few bruises. Buster Keaton may have been influenced by Gibson's stunts when he also did train stunts in 1926's The General. You can learn more about Keaton on this channel. The real difficulty of the stunt lay not in the leap itself, since she had practiced this with the train stationary and it clearly presented no difficulties, but in the timing. What such stunts require is an inbuilt awareness of the speed of the moving object, an understanding of physics. During the course of the leap where a moving object is concerned, the spatial relationship between takeoff point and landing point changes. It is quite possible to imagine a leap from a static takeoff point onto the roof of a moving train in which the stuntman or stuntwoman aims to land halfway along a carriage roof, yet in fact because of the speed of the train lands in the gap between two carriages. It seems that in such a leap the safest place to aim is the gap itself, at least in that way one can guarantee to miss it. Helen Gibson had this sensitivity to spatial relationships between objects in motion, but it is certainly not a gift shared by all stuntmen. Arthur Wise would write in Stunting in the Cinema in 1973. The Hazards of Helen premiered in November 1914, and Holmes was the titular telegraph operator, but was replaced by Gibson in 1915. She is underestimated by her male colleagues and constantly called upon to save passengers from robbers and runaway trains, but she retains her femininity and displays affection towards children. Considered the longest serial in history, the 119 weekly episodes of The Hazards of Helen are standalone stories instead of chapters in an ongoing narrative. The highly successful series had begun with Helen Holmes in the lead role for the first 49 episodes, but Helen Gibson was given her chance to replace Holmes for two pictures when she took ill, and starred in A Test of Courage and A Mile a Minute for $35 a week. The Calum New York office personnel were so impressed by her, they instructed Glendale to keep her on when Helen Holmes and her husband, Hel Hazards of Helen director J.P. McGowan, left to form their own company, undoubtedly perturbed at the replacement of Holmes. Audiences would go to the cinema each week to see what their favorite stuntwoman was up to. Now rechristened Helen by the studio to merge her on-screen and off-screen personas, Helen proved to be a capable actress, and after making several more pictures, she wrote a story for a one-reeler that was built around a risky stunt. To catch a runaway train, she would detach a team of horses, ride them standing woman, and then catch a rope dangling from a bridge and use it to swing from the horses and onto the train as it came under the bridge. The stunt was successful, and Calum rewarded her by raising her salary to $50 a week. Helen thought up her own stunts, but others weren't so impressed. 
Complications arose from an anxious insurance adjuster who flatly refused the actress coverage by declaring her an unsound risk. Life is just cluttered up with perils, Helen responded. Helen performed in The Hazards of Helen for 69 episodes until the series ended in February 1917, after which Calum tried producing a repeat, another serial, The Daughter of Daring, with a starring role for Helen. One of her best stunts appeared in this serial. Traveling at full speed on a motorcycle chasing after a runaway freight train, Helen rode through a wooden gate, shattering it completely, up a station platform, and through the open doors of a boxcar on a siding, with her machine traveling through the air until it tr landed on a flat car in a passing train. The trick was to undercrank the camera and execute it all with flawless timing. By then, Calum, a producer of single reel films, was in decline, with audiences abroad in World War I fighting a hopeless war. Rather than risk financial failure producing feature films, Calum pro ceased production in 1917 and was sold to Vitagraph. Universal offered Helen a three year contract at $125 a week for two reel and five reel pictures until 1919. Among these were two 1919 John Ford films, Rustlers and Gun Law. Her Universal contract ended with the winter of 1919, and she signed with Capital Film Company for $300 a week. But Capital was already losing money and went out of business in May 1920. Helen was starting to feel the pinch of a tightening industry. In the early Anything Goes years, serial queens were used to having creative freedom, serving as writers or producers of the works they starred in. From the early 1920s onward, however, the industry solidified with big banks in the East, and Gibson and her peers discovered that the new men running the Hollywood studios were ready to wrest control, profits, and power for themselves and their Zionist ideas away from independent creatives. As a result, roles for American women, both on screen and behind the scenes, began to constrict. So we see Hollywood transition from a wild west of creativity to a rubber-stamped process by bankers. In Helen Gibson's films, we see the American woman as she was for centuries. Tough, independent, gun-toting, daring, fearless, but no pantsuit harridan, no hater of children, no defender of big government. It is a breed of woman that is unique among all other women. Hoot Gibson, who had joined the Army Tank Corps, returned during Christmas 1918, and Universal gave him a contract to appear in two real westerns. The two Gibsons had appeared alongside each other in magazine features for years, but with his absence, he found his wife had become a very successful movie star while he was away, and the couple separated in 1920. Census records for 1920 indicate that they were living separately after seven years of marriage. In any case, Hoot Gibson listed himself as married anyway, and Helen listed herself as widowed. Was Helen's comment a judgment on World War I and her husband's return from that war? So many Americans never really came back, and theirs was a golden generation, almost completely obliterated in a brother war. In 1920, Helen created Helen Gibson Productions to produce her own starring vehicles. Stuntman Buster Keaton would do the same, and this was a way for stuntmen and women to star in films they had more control over. They were risking their own bodies, so why not? The first of Gibson's was to be No Man's Woman, a western melodrama about a kind-hearted dance hall hostess rescuing a rancher's child. The money gave out before the picture was finished, and it bankrupted Helen personally. A year later, the film was released by another studio with a new title, Nine Points of the Law, so perhaps Helen sold the screenplay for money. In March 1921, the Spencer Production Company hired Helen to star in The Wolverine. They were so pleased with her performance, they put her on the payroll at $450 a week. However, before shooting began on her second picture, her appendix ruptured, putting her in the hospital battling peritonitis. The studio had no problem replacing her. 
It's remarkable how little this integral woman was supported, how little of a safety net she had, how little white privilege there was and is. It is a huge contrast to American society today with its many federal safety nets and nationwide rules where certain people are above the law and can do no wrong. After her six-month recovery from surgery, Helen's popularity as a lead had waned. In September 1921, an independent company hired her for a five-reeler, but folded without paying the cast or crew. Riding in the picture put Helen back in the hospital with her sutures ripped, forcing her to sell her furniture, jewelry, and car. She made personal appearances in connection with bookings of No Man's Woman and the Wolverine in theaters and at rodeos, including visiting her old friends at the 101 Ranch in Ponca City, Oklahoma, which was also called the White House. In the spring of 1924, Helen got a job trick riding with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus Wild West Show, along with other cowboy performers such as Ken Maynard, and performed in their after show for two and a half years, which were happy ones for her. In September 1926, Helen joined a Hoppy Indian act and worked in the Keith Vaudeville circuit out of Boston. Men had started to take over female stunt jobs in a practice known as wigging. And perhaps the largest example of female stunt women since Helen's days was Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films, where many of the Rohirrim were women. Helen returned to Hollywood in 1927 and began doubling for stars such as Louise Fazita, Irene Rich, Edna May Olivier, Mary Dressler, Marjorie Main, May Robson, Esther Dale, and Ethel Barrymore. You can learn more about the Barrymore family in their videos on this channel. Helen worked constantly stunt doubling and in uncredited or bit parts. As she had in her heyday, she became a featured guest at benefit rodeos and events such as the annual Santa Barbara Horse Show, which I believe is still ongoing. In 1935, Helen married Clifton Johnson, a studio electrician who had been a chief gunner in the Navy. In 1940, he asked for after active duty in World War II, and while he was serving, she carried on working as an extra and became treasurer of the Stunt Girls Fraternal Organization. In Universal's Hollywood Story of 1951, she was cast as a retired silent film actress alongside Frances X. Bushman, who you can learn about on this channel, William Farnham, and Betty Blythe and she earned $55 for one scene. Tony Curtis, then unknown, who, but who would go on to star with Marilyn Monroe, was assigned to escort Helen and Blythe to the premiere at the Academy Award Theater at the Academy's then headquarters on Melrose Avenue in Hollywood, where the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce gave each silent star a plaque for your outstanding contribution to the art and science of motion pictures, for the pleasure you have brought to millions over the world, and for your help in making Hollywood the film capital of the world. Despite this accolade, it is difficult to find Helen's stunts preserved on film. The Library of Congress doesn't have any, nor do the National Archives. Helen continued to take character parts and extra work until 1954, when she and her husband moved to Lake Tahoe for health reasons. After trying unsuccessfully to sell real estate, they returned to California and bought a home in Panorama City in the San Fernando Valley. Helen suffered a slight stroke in 1957, but she kept working as an extra in film and television. Her last role was in 1961 in John Ford's The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, for which she was paid $35. She was 69 years old. She retired in January 1962 on a motion picture industry pension of just $200 a month plus Social Security. The couple moved to Roseburg, Oregon, where she spent her later years fishing and giving the occasional interview. Helen Gibson died of heart failure following a stroke in 1977, aged 85, 
she had starred in hundreds of films. She said as much a century ago, concluding, I certainly do get angry when I hear someone say, I bet she didn't do that herself.